There we go. Lovely. Um, sorry for the slight delay there, technical hitch. Um, thank you uh, very much for having me. And uh, like Jenny, I need to apologize for uh, not being able to speak to you in Spanish. But I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's my first time in Madrid, and uh, it's, uh, it's a fabulous experience so far. Um, so Ada Lovelace Day. Ada Lovelace Day is uh, an international celebration of the achievements of women in science, technology, engineering, and maths. And this year, it is on Tuesday, the 11th of October. Um, and I really want to talk about, uh, initially, why we need a day devoted to women in STEM. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why, give you a few statistics, and then discuss how Ada Lovelace Day got started and how we've grown. So our world, I think, is now divided by gender uh, pretty much as more than it ever has been in the past. Um, these two coloring books give you a good example. The blue one for boys, obviously, they get uh, dinosaurs and spaceships. And girls get um, fashion and love hearts. Um, I've seen lots of strange things divided by gender. These are balloons. These genuinely are boy balloons with different colors to girl balloons. And, and that seems a bit frivolous. But then you start getting beyond the division by color. So the gender stereotyping in this Lego friend set um, you can probably see the woman in the kitchen cooking and the man in the lounge uh, relaxing. The only thing he's missing is a beer. And then this particular um, picture that makes me quite cross, because the Early Learning Center, the ELC in the UK, is a company that produces educational toys for children. So you would imagine that they would be very aware of gender stereotypes. But in fact, what we have here is the girl gets handbags while the boy gets to be a doctor. And this teaches children from a very young age what they are supposed to be when they grow up. As they create a gender identity, they absorb all of this information. And this feeds into biases in the STEM fields. So I'm going to run through a few stats. These are all from the UK. Now, the actual numbers tend to vary a little bit depending on uh, whose stats and whose report you're looking at. Um, but in general, women make up 46% of the UK workforce, uh, but only between 13 to 17% of the STEM workforce. When you look at the number of IT specialists, it drops to 11%. And when you look at the number of engineers, it drops even further to 9%. Just 9% of engineers in the UK are women. Now, if we look in a little more detail at some of these areas, in computer science, what we see is that girls don't stay in computer science. So at age 16, when they're doing their GCSEs, uh, about 13% of those are, are girls. But when they move on to A-levels, they take at 18, it's just 6.5% of those computer science A-levels are taken by girls. This is despite the fact that girls actually do better in the exams. So 76% of girls taking an IT-related GCSE achieve the higher grades, A star to C compared to just 69% of boys. And unfortunately, the trend in IT has not been good over the last few years. So the number of women in IT is shrinking from 22% in 2001 to 18% in 2014. And the figures I've seen for last year are the same, 18%. So we're not changing those numbers in the right direction. Now, when we look at engineering, as I said, 9% of engineers are women. 6% um, of registered engineers and technicians are women. And this is a major problem in the UK. We are underproducing engineers. 
not by a few thousand, but by tens of thousands. And 64% of employers say that they are worried that a shortage of engineers is going to negatively affect their business. So when we're talking about equality, we're not just talking about an ethical need to provide equality for women. We're talking about the lack of equality having an impact on businesses. If we look at physics, and physics is one of those key STEM qualifications that opens a lot of doors. Despite 30 years of interventions, we haven't seen any positive impact at all. Um, only 7,000 out of the 150,000 girls who are eligible to do a physics A-level actually do. And nearly half of all state schools have no girls studying physics at A-level at all. So this is a serious issue. It's not, however, a lack of ability, because when we look at medicine and veterinary science, what we see is that not only do women um, excel, they are dominating these areas. So 60% of British undergraduates for medicine are girls, are women. And when it comes to veterinary science, that's 75%. Now, in the USA, it's actually 80% of veterinary science undergrads are women. And I have a theory for why this might be. Why do we have so few girls doing computer science and so many going on to do um, veterinary science and, and medicine. And I think part of this is that girls are socialized very young to uh, identify with caring and nurturing roles. That's what they are taught to aspire to. And both medicine and veterinary science are obviously nurturing and caring professions. This is actually a problem because although it would be very easy to look at these numbers and say, well, we have success in these areas, the lack of balance between the genders means that this throws up other problems. So in veterinary science, for example, women tend to want to work with small animals. They want to work with pets, you know, little fluffy cats and puppies and, and rabbits. They don't want to do the big farm animal work, and they aren't that interested in the process-oriented work like research. Um, in the UK, the challenge for the medical profession is that a lot of women want to become family doctors, and they want to work part-time. And that's brilliant for those women. If they want to raise a family and keep a career going at the same time, that's fantastic but the medical establishment has been created around the image of the male doctor, meaning that they have a certain set of expectations about how many doctors need training and how their pattern of work will fit in with the wider health system. And so we're not producing enough doctors to cover for the um, part-time GPs. And this is a, a systemic problem. This is not a problem with women wanting to work full uh, part-time. So, that's a brief overview of, of the shape of the problem. Um, the question I had back in 2008 was, what do we do about this? And I was really sort of prompted to thinking about the issues of women in STEM, because I was working in technology at the time, and I was going to a lot of tech conferences, and there were very few women on stage talking about technology. And every time a new conference lineup was announced, we would go through and count the number of women. And we would challenge the event organizers and say, where are the women in your lineup? And we started to get very similar responses from the organizers. They would say things like, um, we asked the women and they all said no. Um, we couldn't find any women. And my favorite, which was there aren't any women. And I thought, well, that's odd, because I'm in tech and I'm a woman, so the idea that there aren't any women in tech is clearly wrong. In the comments to um, blog posts like this and other blog posts, we would have a discussion about, OK, name five women in tech that you want to see on stage. And it became very clear that we could all name five friends who were women that we wanted to see speaking, but it was very hard to name five senior women because ultimately, we didn't know much about the other women in tech. We knew our communities, but not the wider picture. 
And it was about this time that I stumbled on some research by a psychologist called Penelope Lockwood. And she found that women need female role models more than men need male role models. And, and I thought, if we're looking at role models, that we need to create more role models, you know, that seems like something we can do. Because a role model really is just a person that we look to for inspiration. And how do we find these people? We talk about them. We hear about them from other people. So I decided to launch a day of blogging about women in technology to encourage everyone to write about the women that they knew and write about their work so that we could all learn more about the different women in tech. I kind of needed a name for this day um, because the International Day of Blogging about Women in Technology doesn't really trip off the tongue. Uh, and a friend of mine suggested Ada Lovelace. Now, I'd not heard of Ada Lovelace, so I did what any self-respecting journalist does and went to Wikipedia to look her up. And it turns out that Ada Lovelace is a great uh, figure in the history of technology. Um, she was born in 1815. She's the daughter of Lord Byron, the Romantic poet, and uh, Anne Isabella Milbank, Baroness Wentworth. Now, the amazing thing about Ada Lovelace was that she became friends with the inventor Charles Babbage. And he had put together plans for a general purpose computing machine that he called the analytical engine. Now, this was a programmable machine. It used loops of punched cards. Um, and so it could do quite complex computation if you had the instructions correct. And what Ada did, she was writing about the analytical engine and how she could see it working. And she wrote a program to calculate Bernoulli numbers. And what she did was she took the algebra for the Bernoulli numbers and broke it down into very simple calculations that the analytical engine could then do. And each calculation is listed in this column, and they save to the variables. So this was the most elaborate program, and it was the first program to be published. And so she became known, really, as the first computer programmer. But really, as impressive as the Bernoulli program is, that isn't what set Ada apart, even from uh, people like Babbage, who, who understood the analytical engine so well. What Ada saw was that a general purpose computing machine could do more than just calculate numbers. If it could manipulate symbols, it could create anything. It could create music or art. And she wrote that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns, just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And this was a huge leap. No one else at the time understood just what the analytical engine could have been capable of. Uh, it was never actually built, so she never got to test her program. And yet, she foresaw what computer science is today. So I had my figurehead, Ada Lovelace, and we had our first uh, Ada Lovelace day planned. And what we needed was a way to bring people together. And there, is, there was a site in the UK called Pledge Bank. It's sadly now archived. And the idea was you would promise to do something if a certain number of other people promised to do the same. And so my pledge was that I will publish a blog post on Tuesday, the 24th of March, about a woman in technology whom I admire, but only if a 1,000 other people do the same thing. In the end, we actually got nearly 2,000 people signed up to Pledge Bank, and there were another 2,000 people who signed up to a Facebook event that a friend of mine had created for it. Uh, we also got lots of media interest. So the BBC uh, wrote actually sort of four posts in different parts of the website about Ada Lovelace Day. Um, I also did an interview on the BBC News Channel. Computer Weekly, which is a, a magazine in the UK, they were very keen on Ada Lovelace Day. They supported it a huge amount. 
um, as did The Guardian. And this was really not what I was expecting, I have to confess. I honestly thought that first Ada Lovelace day um, that it would be me and a few friends, that we would uh, write a few blog posts. Uh, they would probably be a one-off event. We'd do it that year, and that would be that. That it really wouldn't have that much of an impact. I really kept my expectations low. Um, but I at least would feel better. I would feel I had done something. In actual fact, uh, we ended up with a total of 3,600 people getting engaged. Um, we had a 1,000 or more blog posts that were written on the day. It became an annual event with global impact, and I felt quite surprised by it all. So that was the first Ada Lovelace Day, and we've evolved a lot since then. And part of that has been to do with um, the rise and fall of blogging in the UK, that actually blogging is not as popular as it once was. And what people have done, completely independently of me, is they have decided that to celebrate Ada Lovelace Day, what better than to organize their own events? Uh, and so that's what started to happen. So we've shifted from being a day of blogging about women in tech to being a day of blogging and events about women in STEM. Now, the focal point of our year is Ada Lovelace Day Live, which is uh, a science cabaret. Um, we get seven or eight women together to talk about their work. So we've had um, demonstrations. This is Fran Scott uh, lighting flammable things on fire with a spark. We've had talks about why humans laugh, um, about the ExoMars rover and uh, its search for life on Mars. Uh, and even really quite complex talks about how we grow bone for bone grafts. Um, and they're all up online on YouTube. Around the world, uh, people joined in wherever they were. We had an amazing year last year. We had six events in Spain. We had three here in Madrid, as well as events in Alicante, um, Granada, and Barcelona. But we've also started working more of a year-round um, kind of work. So we, uh, in the last two years, we've released two books about women in science. Um, I've tried to steer clear of the gender stereotyping in the covers, uh, hence the big shark on one and the plane on the other. Um, and these are all written, the chapters are all about um, individual or groups of women in STEM written by authors from around the world. Um, we've also put together an education pack, uh, and that includes um, teaching scenarios, list of resources, and also free posters that teachers can download and print out. This first poster is based on research by the Science Council, and it's trying to explode the myth that if you are a scientist, you just sit in a lab with a white coat looking down a microscope all day. Um, the second poster is uh, careers data from an annual survey of UK graduates. And what you have is your A-levels um, on the left-hand side, and they lead to a certain number as 15 different degree areas, subject areas. And then all around the outside, these are all the actual jobs and um, further study that students were doing six months after they graduated in 2014. So this is all real people and real data. And the idea is to show children that actually STEM opens doors, that you can do anything with a STEM degree. It isn't just, like I say, the white coat and the microscope. Um, we've also uh, put together, uh, started merchandising, so posters and notebooks. Um, our first one, obviously, about Ada Lovelace, and the second one about Mary Anning, who was an amazing paleontologist who found the first plesiosaur. Um, so we've grown a huge amount over the last seven years. Um, our web traffic, you can see we've, uh, uh, you can see the spikes for Ada Lovelace Day quite clearly. Um, in 2012, there's this sort of odd little second spike, which really confused me to start with, but. It's actually when Google decided to do an Ada Lovelace Day Google Doodle. 
why they chose to celebrate her 197th birthday instead of waiting three years for a nice round 200 um, is anyone's guess. When we look at the worldwide events as well, we can see how they've really taken off. Um, the first year, 2009, it was all online. Uh, the second year, we had a small meetup in London. And we started our, our Ada Lovelace Day live in 2011. And then in 2012, quite organically, you know, this was nothing to do with me. This was not my idea. People just started putting on Ada Lovelace Day events. Um, and so we've been encouraging that. And this year, we had 154 events in 82 cities in 25 countries with at least one event planned on every single continent, including the really big cold one at the bottom. I was very excited to see something happening in Antarctica. The one area where um, we haven't massively increased is in staffing. Um, I used to run Ada Lovelace Day part-time in my so-called spare time as I ran my own business. Uh, and then uh, last year, our staffing levels rocketed to um, a whole one person, uh, which is me. I now work on Ada Lovelace Day full time because um, we had enough sponsorship in to allow us to do that. But it does mean that we get to do a lot more. So how did we get here? Really, there are two factors involved. The first one, I will be honest, we kind of hit the zeitgeist. You know, as they say, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. In 2008, 2009, there was a lot of frustration about the lack of women uh, and the lack of visibility of women in technology. There were the tools like Pledge Bank and Facebook to bring people together. And blogging was still popular. So it was a really easy thing to ask people to write a blog post. It didn't feel like it was a, a complicated thing to ask people to do. The other thing that we benefited from was that at that time, um, social media was quite widespread. So there were enough people on Twitter and on Facebook for it to be useful. But it wasn't very noisy. It was still a very informative um, medium. Now it is a real challenge to get attention because there's so much going on on social media. Um, you've got brands constantly trying to get you to buy stuff, lots of people sharing news, the latest thing that you should be outraged about or laughing about, the latest kitten pictures. Um, but back then, actually, it was a much cleaner environment with a, a lot more uh, signal and a lot less noise. Now, the key thing about social media, obviously, is it is a network of networks. And this is an analysis of some of our followers. Um, and actually, the, the red down here, that's uh, Thientia and Redes. So that's, that's you guys. Um, the yellow group at the top there, that is a cluster around the uh, UK Science Council. And then this purple one, that's Dr. Helen Chersky, uh, who is a physicist who does a lot of TV presenting. So you can sort of start to see how um, you get into different communities through things like Twitter and Facebook. Um, that means that as a tiny organization, you can reach orders of magnitude more people through social media than you ever could through a traditional hub and spoke medium like mailing list. Um, and it means that small organizations have a lot more clout than they would otherwise. But small organizations also have other challenges that larger organizations don't. And I'm really talking here about sort of one to five people sized organizations. In the UK, we call them nano businesses. And if you are a nano business, you have a real challenge. Because if you're in a big organization, the way that you should be doing your social media is you start off with a strategy. And this gives you your business goals, tells you who you, your audience is, um, what your resources are. And once you have a good, solid social media strategy, then you can develop your tactics. So these are you know, the tools that you're using, the messages that you want to send, you know, how often you're going to tweet, all of that kind of stuff. And then once you've got your tactics, you can begin implementation. Now, if you are a nano business, this, whilst very nice in theory, kind of falls apart. Because 
what happens is you get to a point where you are so busy trying to run your organization that you feel you just have to tweak something, anything, just to be out there. So what you have to do as a nano business is optimize for your scale, optimize for small. Using organic assets is really important. So these are the kind of assets that you would be creating anyway. You don't, don't necessarily have the resources to do a special set of assets for social media. But in our case, we use our book covers. We tweet those out. We use um, the posters that we've created, the educational resources we've created. So we use the, the assets that we are creating in the course of doing our work. A friend of mine who works in marketing gave me the advice many years ago that you should use every asset at least three times. So don't just tweet something once and think that that's it, you're done. You know, put it on Facebook, put it on Pinterest. And this is um, something that I've taken to heart. And we try and use all of our assets as often as we can. Another difference between big organizations and nano businesses is that as a nano business, you have to use the platforms that you like. If you try to force yourself to use a platform that you don't enjoy using, you will just put it off. You will not actually use it. Um, so you need to feel comfortable where you are. If you're a big organization, you can hire people with the right skill set and interests, and you can go where your audience is. Um, if you're a small organization, you need to be a bit more pragmatic. The other thing is it's better to do one or two things very well than try and do everything. Because there are so many me social media platforms now, you cannot be everywhere, because otherwise you just wouldn't get anything else done. So I'm going to give a quick look at our platforms, the ones that we use. Um, Twitter is definitely my primary social media platform, but we also have a forum on our website, a blog, Facebook, and we've just started using Pinterest as well. So this is, this is our first tweet. Um, scheming, I had no idea back in 2008 what I was letting myself in for. Um, one of the reasons that I love Twitter is because it's very easy to use from multiple devices. It's on my laptop, it's on my phone, it's on my tablet. Um, I can schedule tweets, so I can uh, set things up ahead of time. And also, Twitter produces a lot of traffic for us. And I think that is um, a large part to do with the fact that Twitter's demographic, it tends to be more educated, more professional, um, have more disposable income. And these are the sorts of people that we are trying to reach. So the Twitter tools um, that I use, tools for Twitter have evolved a huge amount over the years. When I first started using um, Twitter, it was just the website. And then as different Twitter clients uh, came on the market, you know, they would, you would find your new favorite, and then Twitter would release an update to the API, and the developers would be slow, and then you'd move to something else. So we've been through constantly cycling through different Twitter tools. So my uh, most important one is Tweetbot for Mac and iOS, uh, Hootsuite as well, and finally, a new one called Edgar. So this is my Tweetbot um, screen from last week. Uh, and the thing I like about this is it allows me to manage multiple accounts. So on the left-hand side here, this is my personal timeline for at Sue. The two middle columns are Ada Lovelace Day timeline. So I've got my timeline and my mentions. And then the uh, one on the far right, this is obviously the most important Twitter account that I run because that's my cat. Um, and you've got to have a tweeting cat. So I use Tweetbot for monitoring real-time discussions. So this is what are people saying now? What are they saying to me? What are they retweeting? What can I retweet? Um, and quite often what I find is, because I can see across these th um, three accounts, that I will see a tweet in my at Sue timeline that I think is relevant to finding Ada. And so I can just tweet it, retweet it from Finding Ada. So it makes it really easy to juggle different accounts. Hootsuite 
does do that to some extent. You can have columns and monitor keywords and searches and um, different accounts. But I use Hootsuite almost exclusively for scheduling tweets. So one of the things that we give to our sponsors is a, a, a number of thank you tweets throughout the year. And if I had to remember to tweet on a given day, that would be frankly, a disaster. So what I do is I sit down and I schedule all of my tweets for the next six months or even the next year so that I know that those thank you tweets are going to go out on the right day, at the right time, with the right message. I also use Hootsuite for scheduling uh, tweets around events. So whether it's one of our events that we're running or whether it's an event that I think is relevant to my audience, I can set up a load of tweets saying, you know, buy your tickets, go along to this meetup, uh, get involved. And that, again, allows me to, to have a short burst of activity where I set up these tweets and I can to rest assured that they're going to go out. Edgar is a new app. It's only been around a few months. I started using it about two months ago. And it works very differently to the other Twitter tools I've ever used. So the way that Edgar works is you create a library of tweets and you categorize them. These are all the current categories that I've got. This is the, the current queue. And you set up a schedule. So for example, these, this green one is Ada Lovelace Day Live tweets. So these are tweets about the um, event from previous years. And then as we get closer to October, those will be tweets about who our speakers are, what our venues like, um, and how to buy tickets. So you set up your schedule, and Edgar will take a tweet from your library and publish it at the scheduled time. And then when it has worked its way through the library, it starts again from the beginning. So this basically means that you never run out of tweets. There is always something going out. So I can go on holiday, and I know that Twitter's taken care of. And I don't have to sit and upload a spreadsheet of tweets to Hootsuite every week. I was using Hootsuite to do this, and I tried Buffer. Um, and they both suffer from the same problem, which is firstly, you can't duplicate tweets. So that means if you want 50 tweets, they've all got to be unique. Um, and secondly, it actually takes ages to format them in the spreadsheet and make sure you've got the time and the date and everything in the right order and then get them uploaded. Edgar takes that time and lets you do other things with it because everything is uh, much faster, much easier. It has its downsides, which is um, you can't have a random timing. I would love to be able to say, take a tweet from that category and just tweet it at a random time during the week. Um, and you can't schedule, say, a monthly tweet or every two weeks. It has to be weekly. But apart from that, I think Edgar's actually a really great tool. Now, if you don't like the sound of repeating tweets, because there has been a time in, in Twitter history where um, that was very much frowned upon. You weren't supposed to repeat tweets. Um, the key thing to remember is that a tweet has a very short lifespan now. So only 46% of Twitter users log in every day. And less than a third log in more than once per day. And the average length of a visit to Twitter is just 13 minutes. So this means that the vast majority of your followers on Twitter aren't actually on Twitter when you're tweeting. When you take all these and calculate how long a tweet lasts on Twitter, it's about 24 minutes. So within the first 24 minutes of any tweet, it will receive half of the attention that it will ever get over the whole of the rest of its lifespan. So when you think about um, how long a tweet really lasts, and you start thinking as well about time zones, so 42% of the Finding Ada followers are in the UK. 30% are in the USA. Um, the other 28% are scattered over 93 countries around the world. Um, and we have 1.8% of my Twitter followers are, are here in Spain. I'm hoping we can get that up to 2% by the end of today. 
this this is a lovely map um, of our followers, and you can see it, it's pretty global. Um, Russia, obviously, they're not keen on us, but never mind. So if you assume that my British followers are waking up around 7 a.m., and they could be online on Twitter at any point during the day, and that my West Coast American followers are online until, say, 11 p.m. in their day. Well, 11 p.m. on the West Coast is 7 a.m. the next day in the UK. So my Twitter followers are online 24 hours a day. I'm not. Um, I do need to sleep. So that means that I have to be tweeting 24 hours a day in order to reach everyone, and that means scheduling. There are three other occasional tools that I use that are quite useful. Um, Tweeps Map, so that map you just saw was from Tweeps Map, and they can provide some quite interesting data. They have a free service. You have to give them a sacrificial tweet in order to access the information. Um, tweet Reach, uh, and also Twitter's own analytics can provide some interesting data. So Tweet Reach basically allows you to find out how far a particular URL or phrase has gone. So this is the URL for our uh, school's education pack. Um, and this is the last week. And we can see 50,000 accounts reached, uh, 70,000 impressions. Uh, and it also gives you a list of uh, who's tweeting. And in this case, um, you can see everyone's retweeting the same tweet. The Twitter analytics is quite interesting as well. This gives you a slightly different view of your tweet activity. So one of the things that becomes very obvious from Twitter analytics is that the most popular tweets are visual. They have images associated to them. They do far, far better than just text tweets. And this is changing how I'm tweeting. I'm adding more images and trying to be more visual. So Twitter, for me, as I said, has really been our main social media platform. I'm going to very quickly go through um, some of the others. This is our forum. We use software called Discourse. Uh, it's very flexible, very good, very uh, good on the spam protection side. Um, we've had used other forum software, and it's been really bad for spam. Now, we don't have very many regular users on our forum, but it's actually a hugely useful resource for for me and, and for the users who do use it. Because what we do is we use it to collect links and to talk about research and, uh, and to do research in some ways. So I'm collecting resources for STEM for the under 10. So this is things like books and websites, magazines, that kind of thing. Because one of the projects, one of my long-term projects, is to do a resource pack for parents of under 10s. Um, we also have a whole section devoted to information about women in STEM, whether they're historical or new. And this is really collecting um, news articles, mainly, about different women in STEM. Now, our blog is hosted by um, WordPress Engine. Uh, so it's secure. Um, WordPress is quite... Um, can be quite vulnerable to hacking. So I wanted to go with a secure host. And WordPress Engine uh, very kindly hosts us for free. Um, it also means that we get updated. So I don't have to keep remembering to go in and update um, the, the underlying software, because that's done automatically. And this is as much about me saving time. If someone else is doing the update, so much the better. We mostly use. Um, our blog to talk about our news, so new sponsors, uh, speakers, um, when we're doing our event. Um, sometimes we'll look at a new piece of research around gender and uh, discuss um, you know, how good it is or bad it is. Uh, and we talk as well occasionally about um, women that we want to highlight. Um, the top post there is uh, when we uh, announced the Royal Astronomical Society as one of our sponsors. And the other thing that we have started to do more of is to work with um, organizations, professional organizations, uh, and to give them reach into a different community so that they can actually um, reach more women. So this, uh, the ICE Civils Comeback Scheme, this was uh, about trying to encourage more women back into engineering. 
Uh, Facebook, when I mentioned earlier about using platforms that you like, um, I've always disliked Facebook quite intensely, primarily because of the privacy problems, particularly in the early days. Um, but it has become uh, more, it's become a tool that I use a lot more often now that I've moved from the UK to live in America because suddenly it's the only way I can keep up with some of my friends. So using Facebook more gives me a better appreciation for it. When we first started with Facebook, it was uh, a Facebook event, and that's morphed into a Facebook group. Again, we had a lot of problems with spam in the early days of the Facebook group, so that ended up being a closed group. What we're doing now is we've created a Facebook page, which is public, um, and I'm going to see how it goes, and I'll probably close the group and migrate everything over to the page if it goes well. The main thing that I'm doing differently with Facebook now compared to how I used to use it is it's much more about linking out to other bits of content. Um, so a recent post that was very popular was about a journalist called John Platt who vowed to only interview 50% uh, men and 50% women. That He set himself a target in his science writing to be, give equal weight to um, male and female sources. Um, I think Facebook's interesting um, in terms of linking it in with other things uh, and trying to make sure that it's, um, it's connected with everything else that we do, but also um, has its own uh, character. Um, and finally, Pinterest, we've just started using like a couple of weeks ago. And again, this is about the lesson from Twitter that visual tweets are uh, the most shared tweets. Pinterest is all about the visuals. And what I've done is uh, you know, save some of our visuals, but it's also about looking at teaching resources about women in STEM and having a way to sort of collect that information in a visual way. As a writer myself and as a, a freelance journalist, I tend towards words. You know, my default is always to write a blog post, but other people don't work like that. So I'm learning how to be more visual and think more visually because that's actually what a lot of people on the internet like. Um, so one of my challenges for 2016 is we need to grow our community. Um, it's actually uh, been quite hard over the last few years to get attention. The uh, issues around women in STEM are often seen as quite worthy, so it's a bit like telling people to eat their broccoli. Um, and I'm trying to get away from that worthiness and make it something that's a little bit more um, enjoyable. Um, so with the blog, one of the things that I'm doing is, is content sharing with learned societies and professional organizations. And that's about um, me hoping to reach their communities as well as giving them the opportunity to reach my community. On Facebook, um, like I said, really about posting much more relevant content. There is a sort of unwritten rule of the internet that if you send people away to interesting places, they will come back to you more and more often. And so Facebook is as much about saying, there's some interesting stuff over there, go and have a look at it, um, and a lot less about me talking about what Ada Lovelace Day is doing. And Pinterest being uh, a lot more visual. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do as well is kind of cross-post between Twitter and Pinterest and Facebook when I find something particularly good, because again, it's about using every asset three times, making sure that you reach all of your community. Now, a challenge, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will um, relate to the first challenge that I have, is time. I spent 12 years working as a social media consultant. If all I had to do was social media, I could put together the best strategy and fantastic implementation, but I never have time. I really struggle to actually think strategically when actually most of my day is organizing the event, dealing with sponsors, fundraising, all of those things that I have to do um, means that social media tends to be the first thing that I forget to do or the first thing that I put aside when I get um, overwhelmed with, with everything else that's going on. Related to that issue is consistency. Before Edgar, for example, 
Twitter would be very bursty. I would sit down and do lots of tweets, and then there'd be nothing for a day. And that's not good. That's not how social media works, because that's not how um, your audience uh, consumes their social media. They're not sitting there waiting for you to suddenly start tweeting. So it's much better to tweet little and often, to post on Facebook daily rather than having a big session on a Friday afternoon. Um, and as I said, reaching new audiences, it's not enough for me to preach to the choir, especially around an issue like um, women in STEM. You know, I need to be reaching uh, new audiences, and I need to be reaching the influencers, and those are mostly around reaching men, actually. I want to get more men involved and get more men to um, step up and actually say that women uh, and, and equality is an issue that they care about. So this is us on uh, social media, uh, including our brand new Pinterest account. So please do come and follow us. Um, I need to say thank you to our sponsors and particularly to Arm, who uh, uh, made it possible for me to go full time. And thank you also to last year's sponsors. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Bueno, y todavía tenemos un poquito de tiempo por si le queréis hacer alguna pregunta a Su. Yeah, may I, may I know what about money? What about profits? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you do that? And so how do you get the money? How do I get the money? I get the money from mostly those lovely sponsors um, I just showed you. Um, the vast majority of our income comes from businesses who sponsor us, and they're mostly sponsoring Ada Lovelace Day Live. Um, the reason that I started the merchandise uh, line was that I would like to build up an independent, regular income from that merchandise. We have obviously quite a way to go uh, before we reach that goal. Um, I also have a Patreon account where people, if they want to, can donate. Um, it's, it's a tricky one in terms of visualizing where we go financially. Um, I need to increase the amount of money that I raise by an order of magnitude. You know, I really need to be able to hire someone to do admin. In my ideal world, I'd hire a historian and a graphic designer and a biz dev person. And so that's my goal, is to be able to start hiring staff so that it's not just me and just the stuff that comes out of my head. Um, I mean, watching Jenny's talk earlier was fantastic, because I was sitting there going, oh, it's been so long since I've kind of seen new ideas. Um, and part of that problem is working on your own, it gets quite claustrophobic, and you end up stuck in your own head. Um, so I'm actually uh, embarking on a, a round of um, fundraising where I'm, I'm going to learned societies, professional bodies, and businesses to say, you know, this is what we do. We think this is something you should be involved with. Uh, give us cash. Um, and then once I can hire a designer, then I can expand the merchandise line, and then hopefully we can become self-sustaining. That's the plan. Well, sounds good. Alguna? Um, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting you to speak in the Girls in ICT International Day. So it's, it's a great and inspirational talk to listen today. And um, one of the things that I, uh, that I would like to ask is, uh, I'm working on a science communication uh, project about women in STEM. And um, what I've been uh, sensing is uh, young researchers, uh, or at least female young researchers, they do not perceive uh, the gender inequality in STEM. Mm. And as I talked with, uh, from young researchers to senior scientists, women in STEM, there are more than five, definitely, um, 
they are more conscious about it and they want to be active about it. They want to mentor students. Um, how can you involve the youngsters mm. in this fight as well? That's a really good question. Um, I think the younger women, speaking from my own experience, when I first started working in um, technology, I felt that um, I'd found my peer group. And I was, for the first several years, quite oblivious to the sexism. Um, my degree is actually geology. Uh, and again, I was kind of oblivious to the sexism that was uh, going on around me. And I look back at some of the things that happened, and I just think, how did I not see this? Like, what was going through my head? And I think the problem is that when you're young, you do have a tendency to take things at face value. So you're not necessarily looking at people's deeper motivations. And that makes it very easy to miss the, the signatures of sexism. And that's especially problematic when sexism is as subtle as it can be. So if you look about uh, how we think about what sexism was like back in the, the sort of 60s and 70s, and, and it was all about um, Men you know, being very patronizing, it was about unwanted physical contact, you know, being slapped and all of that sort of very obvious sexism that we would look at now and go, that's completely unacceptable. But the way that it manifests now is much more subtle. It's things like um, women not having their ideas taken seriously. So you're in a meeting, you're a woman, you have an idea, no one says anything, and then a guy says exactly the same thing, and suddenly it's the best idea ever. Um, it's about how often women are interrupted. So again, let's say you're in a meeting, and you know, you're know you making your point, and some guy just starts cutting across you. That's much harder to point out. So I think young women today, um, they actually have a harder time recognizing what's going on. And I think we need to um, involve them by, by trying to get them to become more aware and more observant just in their day-to-day -day experiences so that they're actually aware that, you know, when that guy always interrupts you every meeting, that's not because what you're saying has no value. That's because he's being a jerk. And actually pointing that out, and, and the number of times I've pointed this out to um, women of all ages, and they've gone, yeah, actually, you're right. So I think it's much more subtle now, which means that we need to be much, we need to do more outreach to younger women and sort of try and say, you know, sexism isn't the blatant, obvious, mad men stereotype stuff. Actually, it's, it's much more pervasive, and these are the things you need to look out for. Um, and that actually might be a blog post I should probably write. <laughs> bueno, pues muchas gracias. Ya nos hemos quedado sin tiempo. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Gracias.